Thing, if you wouldn't mind taking your seats. Let me get one thing out of the way real quickly. Um, I'm wearing my shirt out, but that's not any attempt to be hip or cool. <laughs> Hipness and coolness is really not in my repertoire. This shirt is actually made to be worn out, and I was going to tuck it in, and then when I was hooking up with my mic today, I thought, you know what, it'd be a lot easier to leave it out, but then you might think I'm trying to be cool and hip and seeker sensitive, <laughs> so I want to make sure you didn't think that. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, you, don't have, you really don't ever have to worry about that. <laughs> Anyhow, turn with me. Gospel of John, chapter 13. I just want it to be a distraction to you the rest of the service. <laughs> or to be a subject of uh, lunchtime conversation. Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Uh, this is really the next to last message in a series I was preaching called I Am a Disciple. Disciples, one who knows Jesus, follows Jesus, leads others to do the same. The mission that Jesus gave the church was to make disciples of the nations. John 13, verse 34, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if, condition there, if you have love for one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that, um, Lord, that you sustain us. I thank you that you've given us your word. You, you didn't just kind of leave us with no information or very little information, but Lord, you, uh, when you ascended to the Father, you left your spirit and you live in us by your spirit. And Lord, your word, which you inspired and you gave to us, Lord, you made sure that it was formed. And, and your word informs us of your will and your purpose and your love for us. And we're, we're thankful for your word and we're thankful for the amazing quality of your word that year after year, week after week, year after year, day after day, continually, Lord, you, you speak to us in fresh ways through the ancient word. Thank you that it sustains us and nourishes us. Help me, Lord, as I explain it, as I preach it. Lord, I, I recognize my own limitations. So, uh, Holy Spirit, I depend on you. And I ask, Lord Jesus, for your spirit to rest upon me and anoint me and help me. And I pray that you help all the rest of us that are here, Lord, to just be good listeners. But in the end, not to be just hearers of the word, but to be effectual doers in Jesus' name. Amen. I will occasionally wear a Philadelphia Eagles game jersey. The game jersey marks me as a fan of the Eagles. Some of you, unfortunately, wear Giants jerseys or Dallas jerseys. But whatever it might be, whatever your favorite team is, occasionally you might wear a jersey and it marks you as a fan of that team. If you are married today, you most likely wear a wedding ring. And that wedding ring marks you as being married and, in a sense, belonging to someone else. In the late 80s through about the mid-90s, our church sponsored Christian refugees from the former Soviet Union. They had been persecuted, and they had been allowed to leave and come to the United States, and we resettled them here. In, in the former Soviet Union they were unable to speak vocally about their faith. It was illegal for them to do that. So one of the things that they did is they had a little ribbon or a little insignia that they would wear on their outer clothing and that marked them as being a Christian. Anyone who saw that saw that person, that was a Christian. It marked them as being a Christian. And here in the Gospel of John, when Jesus talks here, the supreme mark, the most compelling mark, the mark above all marks that marks you and marks me as being a Christian is love for one another. So let's look at this again. Let's, let's take this apart just a little bit. Back to the text. It says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Now, in what sense was it a new commandment? I mean, these guys were familiar. First of all, in the Old Testament, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. They were familiar with teaching on neighbor love. Jesus kind of dropped a bombshell on them in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 when he says, you, you've heard it said, love your neighbor. I say to you, 
love your enemy and pray for them. I mean, that was revolutionary. In what sense was this a, a new commandment? One of, the, one of the things that you see, too, we, we ought to point out here, is this love for one another has to do with loving your brother and sister in the Lord. The Bible says in Galatians, to uh, do good to all men, but especially to the household of faith. So neighbor, neighbor love, really, love for enemy for that matter, takes you out to the forest as far as you can go. In other words, you're supposed to love everybody. And now he's talking about a particular love for your brother and sister, but that's still not necessarily what makes this unique or a new commandment. What makes this a new commandment is what the, is the standard of that love. The scripture says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. The new standard, the new quality of that love was that we must love one another as Christ has loved us. That's the new standard, high standard. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. And then furthermore, in verse 35, it says, by this. By what? By this observable love that you have for one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The world has given something of a litmus test by which they can evaluate and they can pass judgment as to whether you're a Christian or whether I'm a Christian. I mean, that's what the Bible is doing there, is giving them the, the right to judge whether or not you're a follower and whether or not I'm a follower based on the observable love that they see taking place in the body of Christ, Christian for Christian. Now, that's not to say, that's not to say that their judgment is necessarily true and accurate because sometimes you're going to fail in your love and sometimes I'm going to fail in my love. That's just part of who, who we are. That's not a determining factor, but it does say that the world can look at it, and if we're failing in our love for one another, they can make the judgment that, you know what, the faith isn't true, they're really not Christians. Now, we're in another category if we demonstrate a repeated and continual and constant failure to love one another. If you read in 1 John, it says the one that professes Christ and doesn't love his brother. In other words, it's a consistent, repetitive pattern. That's just who they are. It says, well, in fact, there's a high likelihood that they're not Christians. But what's going on here? He says there's a new commandment, and the new commandment is really grounded in this new quality of love. And then secondly, he tells the world, in essence, or he tells the Christians that the world has the right. They can look, and if they say, boy, they're not being loving toward one another, I don't think they're Christians. They have the right to do that. Now, coming back, Verse 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So we'll talk for a few minutes about what it means to love like Christ, because that's the standard that's put there. Now, obviously, I mean, there's so much talk about love. There's songs about love, books about love, movies about love, television, pro love, 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 love. And there's talk about love, and there's the emotions of love, and there's the feelings of love, and there's acts of love, and all of that, and it's fun to talk about that, and it's actually, uh, I, I remember reading a book a few years ago, I still have it in my library, it was a secular book called The Psychology of Love, in which you had, you know, people in a the therapeutic community trying to define for you, here's what love is, and they actually had a hard time doing that, and then some people want to get to the point and say, well, love isn't really a definable quality, it's, it's sort of an abstract thing, you kind of know it if you feel it, you know it if you got it, you know it if it's present, but the Bible really doesn't, uh, doesn't leave it up in the air that way. The scripture says, in fact, we can turn there, actually, 1 John, this is one of the letters, 1 John 3.16, leaves no doubt as to what love is, which is, you know, if Jesus is saying this is a commandment, and that probably should be emphasized too. I just had this conversation within the last week or two. You know, the New Testament is full of commandments. I mean, the fact that we've been graciously apprehended by God and we live under grace doesn't mean there's no commandments anymore. Doesn't mean there aren't certain things. And he says, this is what you do. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And he said, this is a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And if that's a command that he gives us, and we're going to embrace that command, we need to know what exactly that means. In verse 16, 1 John 3, 16, it says, By this, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for the brothers. In um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, the Bible's talking to husbands, and it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself up for us. Now, there's a couple things that we learn immediately from that. Uh, one, 
and this shouldn't be missed. Lo love is, is something that's real and observable. We're talking about observable acts of love. It's also sacrificial. When you're going to love as Christ loved, it's going to be sacrificial. Based on the way that I understand Scripture, in fact, based on what Scripture teaches, I would define Christ-like love as this. Unmerited acts of personal sacrifice done for the good of another. Unmerited acts of personal sacrifice done for the good of another. In other words, not, wow, you know, they really deserve it, so let me do this. These are unmerited acts of personal sacrifice done for the good of another. And it's costly. It sacrifices, it sacrifice, you sacrifice something of yourself for another person. That could be sacrificing time to care for and serve others, maybe help out with an Alzheimer's sufferer, maybe babysit for someone that would need some help that way, maybe being a big brother, maybe helping out a single mom, maybe serving in other ways. In marriage, it might be sacrificing some of your own self-interest, some of your own time and some of your own energy and seeking the best for your spouse, to seek his or her highest good, to find your happiness and your pleasure in bringing him or her the most happiness and the greatest pleasure. It might be that you give up some money and you sacrifice some vacation time and instead go to serve together with your other brothers and sisters in some kind of mission out outreach. It might be giving up a comfortable evening at home. Everybody prizes those, right? Comfortable evening at home in order to go out and maybe serve as part of youth ministry or serve as part of children's ministry or serve as part of one of the other ministries. Or maybe it's getting up early in the morning on a Sunday morning and going out like some of them di those did over here and go out and serve in Camden for an hour or, or so. But, but nonetheless, Jesus says, this is a new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Understand, this is sacrificial love. This is costly love. This is observable love. In Colossians 3, if you turn there, kind of expands our, our insight a little bit on this. Colossians chapter 3. Be 12 through 14. The Apostle Paul is writing here, and he's actually talking about the fact that now you're now that you're a Christian, you need to live like a Christian. Now that you're a Christian, you need to live like a Christian. Now that you're a Christian and you've died to your old ways of life, they need to be dead. And now that you're a Christian and you have new ways of life, you need to live like that. So he uses this imagery of taking off and putting on. There's things you're supposed to take off that have to do with your old life. And there's things you need to put on. So anyhow, that's some of the language that's behind what I'm about to read. Right now we're talking about loving one another. We want to expand that. We want to see that. We know it's sacrificial. We know it's concrete. We know it's observable. Verse 12, Paul writes it this way, Colossians 3. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. In fact, I can't even... I can't even get past that with at least listen to what listen to what God says about you and me about to urge us to put on some things some things that we're supposed to do some things that we're supposed to be but he prefaces it with this put on then as God's chosen ones you know God has laid his favor upon you he has, he has chosen you. A lot of people we wrestle and we struggle about with all this language and choosing and this, that, and the other. But, you know, what, however it breaks down for you, when you read in the scripture, you're in Christ and you belong to God because he said he chose you. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I understand there's a response to the gospel and all that. But understand this, God, and he didn't have to do it, has graciously laid his favor upon you. As God's chosen ones, then he says this, holy, I mean, look, look at your life over the last week, but don't look too hard. But you don't have to look too hard and say, boy, holy? I mean, anybody here wants to say, I was holy last week. <laughs> but he calls us holy because we're in Christ. So his holiness clothes us. And beloved, we're loved of God. I'll come back later on another passage of scripture to this. But know in the deepest resources, of, uh, recesses of your being that God loves you. And he's committed himself to you. More committed to you than you are to him. So he says, put on, then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Then he, this is what he says to put on. Compassionate hearts. 
one thing we, we need to say about love, I mean, the Bible does teach that love is a decision, it's a choice, it's an act of the will, and all, the, all those things are true, but biblical love isn't totally without effect. It isn't totally without uh, this thing inside, this compassionate heart. That's, that's affect. That's, that's some kind of thing inside of you, whether God stirs it or it's stirred up because of the need of the person. It's something there. He says, put on compassionate hearts, kindness. One Bible commentary described our understanding of kindness, kindness this way. He actually gave a, uh, a word picture. And he said it is wine that has, and I don't know much about wine, but some of you I know do, but <laughs> it's wine that has mellowed through the years and lost its harshness. There's a, there's a, um, there's a, a, a softness, not a weakness, but a softness that's there. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility. Meekness, or some of your translations will say gentleness. And you realize gentleness isn't some kind of weakness. I mean, many people have explained it, that it is actually strength under control. And that really is a good definition for meekness or for gentleness. The, the idea, that it, what it suggests, is you're not always trying to push to get your own way. Uh, you're not always trying to get your own agenda going. You're willing to work with and defer to other people. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And this is bearing with one another. Boy, bearing with one another, putting up with one another. You know, one of the underappreciated things in the body of Christ is the call that God has for each one of us that we need to put up with one another. You know, the idea of bearing with one another, it suggests that we're not always easy to live with. We're not always easy to attend church together with. We're not always easy to worship together with. We're not always easy to take a break and go out to the Connect Center and just shake hands and talk to one another. The suggestion is, is if you're going to be a Christian and you're going to follow Jesus and you're going to be part of the body of Christ, then you're going to have to bear with one another. You're going to have to put up with one another. The scripture goes on and says this, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another, so we're to be forgiving, and as the Lord has forgiven you, so you're to forgive as Christ has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And then it says, above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now, everything that we just read, the compassionate hearts, the patience, the kindness, and all of those things, and bearing with one another, and the meekness, these are actually all uh, expressions of love. When you look at this, and he says, put on love. Love is the highest virtue, but if you're not patient with people, if you don't bear with people, if you're not kind toward people, you're not loving. Nor is this kind of suggesting that love sort of sums up all the virtues either or binds them all together. All of them are part of love and all of them are expressions of love. And love is, in fact, the highest virtue. But this idea of binding everything together in perfect harmony, I would take it this way. What, what love does is, is bind the whole community and everything that the community does in perfect harmony. And then that perfect harmony, that perfect harmony actually shows itself in what I'll call an observable unity before the world and even serves a higher purpose. We'll go to John 17 and see that. Now you've got to be tracking with me here. He says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another even as I have loved you. So we're talking about this commandment Jesus has given that we're to love one another just as Christ has loved us. How has he loved us? He laid down his life for us. So it's love, it's sacrifice, it's undertaken, it's observable acts of sacrifice, it's unmerited acts of sacrifice that are undertaken for the good of another. Colossians 3 kind of fleshed it out. You want to know, you know, what it, want to, want to know what it means to be loving? Well, that means you need to be patient with people. You need to be kind with people. You need to forbear with people. You need to put, put up with people. You need to not always try to force your own way and get your own way. And if you can do that and allow love to be that great virtue that binds all the community together and everything the community does together, that perfect harmony shows itself in a unity in the church. John 17 then puts it this way. This is even a, a higher purpose. You've heard this dozens of times with me, from me. John 17, verse 20. Jesus, he's praying. This is the high priestly prayer. And he says, I do not ask for these only, meaning the disciples that are present with him 
just prior to his crucifixion. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. The, the apostles generally are the ones that pen the New Testament. You came to believe one way or another through the words that they wrote down under the inspiration of the Spirit. Those who come to believe in me through their word. Hey, what's his prayer? That they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So the unity that he's praying for, and I've explained this many times in the past, is a supernatural unity. He's saying, Father, the unity that you and I experience as part of the triune Godhead, Lord, I'm praying that they have the same kind of unity. See, that's supernatural. You can't create that. You can't do that. You don't have the capacity to do that in and of yourself. But that's what he's praying for. Says that you, you're in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Why? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. So, as we love one another, and of course that becomes a litmus test, the world can look whether or not we're disciples. Well, the Bible teaches that this love that we have for one another will result in a perfect harmony that expresses itself in a unity where the world, when they look at it, at least some in the world, uh, or the purpose of it is for witness so that they may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I've given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, just like us. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one or they may become perfected in unity. Again, this is supernatural. There's no one that can do this on their own. You can't do in Whatever setting you have, if human relationships involved, you can't, in your own power, in your own strength, in your own ability, achieve some kind of perfect unity. But here's Jesus praying to the Father, and the Father always hears him when he prays. And he says, this is a prayer that I'm praying for the church, that they would be perfectly one. And you understand, the people there, I emphasize this again and again, but sometimes we forget that the people that were there, the early disciples, weren't, didn't, have necessarily a natural affinity for one another. It needs to be stated, and this is not by accident, that we had Matthew the tax collector and we had Simon the zealot, opposite poles of the spectrum. The zealots hated the tax collectors, and the tax collectors feared and hated the zealots. And Jesus didn't just pray, hey, I hope these guys get along. My prayer is, Father, that they at least get along. My, my, my prayer is that they just, you know, they're able to survive together without killing one another which would seem like a decent prayer to pray, actually. The kind of prayer I would pray, like, I mean, these guys hate each other so much. At least get rid of the hate. Maybe they can just survive together. He says, no, I'm praying. Opposite ends of the spectrum, that they might be perfectly one so that the world might know that you have sent me. Um, we've, we've underestimated the power of, of, of unity in terms of witness to the world because what's going on here or maybe let me put it this way we can't expect the world to believe that Christianity is true unless the world sees a certain oneness among true Christians and there can't be a true oneness among Christians unless there is a genuine love expressed among true Christians it results in that perfect harmony the world is given the right to judge now see here's the here's the truth the fact of the matter is is the gospel is true Jesus did come he did live he did die he was buried he was raised from the dead he did die for our sins and there's salvation in no other name but the world is actually given the right to judge whether that message or not is is true or or accurate or be persuaded that it is based on the unity that they see in the church. Now the church, see in the church, this is different, this is a world judging. In the church we tend to judge whether or not somebody's a true Christian and, and that kind of thing based on, you know, uh, the doctrine, what they believe about Jesus, what they believe about God, the, you know, a believable profession of faith and those kinds of things. But the world is given a different criteria. I mean, the world isn't sitting out there, let, let's see, let's see if this message is true. What do they believe? Oh, do they believe that Jesus actually was God come in the Son and he died, or, or God the Son come in the flesh? Do they? No, they don't do that. The church does that, and the church should do that. What the world does is, let, let's look at the church and see whether or not they're one. Let's look at the church and see whether or not they love one another. If they, if they love one another, wow, at the very least, they're going to be persuaded they are, in fact, followers of Christ. Boy, if the church is one, boy, it, you know, how can that be? How can people, tax collectors and zealots, get along? 
how can black and white get along how can whatever ethnicity you want to call it and age how can they get along how can 70 year olds fellowship with 20 year olds how can that happen how can they be together and love one another in that kind of unity maybe jesus did really come maybe that message is true so they're given the right to to, to, to judge the authenticity and the truthfulness and the veracity of the message based on the love and the oneness that they see in the church. Now, you have to ask yourself, the, if you don't ask yourself the following question, you're just going to go crazy. You've got to ask yourself, how can you do this? Turn with me to 1 John 4. What you discover as a Christian is that, um, well, a couple things. There's a lot of things you discover. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 4. Is it, is it, Jesus, God, he, he regularly asks you to do things that are impossible. And when you read the, t the scripture too, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's, that's often misused. It, do it doesn't mean you can do anything you want whenever you want, however you want. It, it, it doesn't mean that. This idea that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me doesn't mean, you know, if I want to go up in the roof of the building and, you know, I want to fly, you know, that I can do that through Christ who strengthens me. It doesn't mean that at all. It's just nonsense. What it does mean is this, is that anything God gives you to do and anything God calls you to do and anything that God, uh, you, you know, delegates to you and says, this is what you're going to do, or this is a commandment that I give you, whatever God does there, God always supplies. God always supplies. I think it was Augustine that said uh, concerning God, uh, command what you want, uh, command what you want, give what you, what, what you desire, something like that. In other words, Command whatever you want, Lord, and give whatever is necessary in order for me to fulfill the commandment. That's what God does. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. The Bible says, little children, you are from God. Let me point something out here. It doesn't come out in the grammar here. But in the Greek, the you is in the emphatic. That just means it came first in the sentence. But it's an emphatic pronoun. I want to emphasize, you are from, you. In other words, if, if we're doing it vocally, I'd be saying you. We're not talking about all the people out here. You are from God. That apparently was very important for the people to hear. It should be very important for you to hear. You are from God. Or some translations, you are of God. You need to know that means more than I belong to God or you belong to God. The one who's of God or the one who's from God is the one who draws his strength, his knowledge, his wisdom, his ability, even his very nature from God. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. When he says, you are from God, boy, there's kind of connotations there we need to latch on to. You're not the same old person anymore. You're now from God, your behavior, your thinking, your strength, your aspirations, your goals are now oriented in God and from God. Now, Scripture says this, little children, you are from God and you have overcome them. Now, who are the them? We won't spend a lot of time with this, but if you read verses 1 through 3 and read the rest of 1 John, you've overcome them. Who are them? Well, them are the false teachers that are out there, the antichrists that are out there, the things that are in the world that are opposed to the purpose of God. He says, you are from God and you've overcome them. You've overcome these oppressive things or the way we might look at it in a day-to-day. -day. In fact, I like the way the the scripture puts it here actually there's this real assurance there you've overcome them we are overcoming them every day then it says for he who is in you anyone have a new american standard because i'm not reading for the new american standard today okay i love the here's what the new american standard does and they do this properly in my opinion it, okay you are from god and you've overcome them what we're talking about is how we do this thing loving and perfect harmony and um, observable unity that testifies to the reality of christ you're from God. You've overcome them. You overcome these anti-God forces. For he, what the New American Standard does, is puts that he as a capital H. <laughs> yeah, it's how it should be. For he, capital H, who is in you is greater than he, lowercase h, who is in the world. So we've overcome them. For he, just in the interest of time, let me put it this way, it, it, Christ living in you, by the Holy Spirit, for he that is in you is greater than he that's in the world. The lowercase he there, who is it? Well, First John 5, 19, the Bible says this. Uh, it says, we know that we are from God, and the whole world, he's just talked about being from God, and the whole world lies in the 
power of the evil one. The, the big he that lives within you and me, because we're from God, has overcome the little he who holds some kind of sway over the world. And the Bible teaches in Colossians 2, 15 and following that Jesus disarmed rulers and princes and powers and authorities on the cross. The devil's power was broken. The penalty of sin was paid. That doesn't mean that the devil can't exercise certain things in this life and this world, but it means that his power has been broken. I personally am persuaded that, I mean, we talk about how bad things are today, but it seems to me when you look at world history, things were a lot worse prior to the cross than afterwards. Following the cross, you can talk about all, what, what changed human history. Now, there's been a lot of bad things since Jesus died on the cross, but I'll tell you what, the, the cross is a watershed moment in human history. Things have never been the same post-cross because the power of the enemy was broken. His, and his, his eternal destiny was sealed. So... Anyhow, if you're, if you're a Christian this morning, the power of God is already present in you to do whatever he calls you to do. So what does he ask you to do? Well, if, we first, if you're still in 1 John, you go to verse 7. He says, Beloved, let us love one another. What does he give us to do? Love one another. A new commandment I give you is that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, that you love one another. And so prove to be my disciples. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, or it can be read this way correctly, grammatically. Let us love one another because love is from God. See, it? see, love is from God. And guess what, L uh, little children? You, you are from God. And love is from God. So, beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. And whoever loves has been born, from, born of God. Here's the thing. Have you truly been born again by the Holy Spirit? If you really have been born again by the Holy Spirit, something begins to change inside of you. People that have been born again by the Holy Spirit, people that have been born again, born from above, spiritually reborn, they begin to love. And they begin to love people they formerly didn't love. And they begin to express love in, in ways that they formerly didn't express love, such as in acts of personal sacrifice. If you've been born again, boy, the Spirit of God resides in you. And when he says, Beloved, let us love one another, the Holy Spirit is always already there enabling you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Uh, love for one another, in fact, this is another, love for one, one another, says in John 13, it's a proof that you're a disciple. Love for one another is a proof that you've been born again. Love for one another is also a proof that you know God. I would see knowing God, and this idea of knowing God is growing in God, Knowing God is, is inextricably linked to loving others because as you know God more and more, you begin to pick up his traits. You know, when you walk with somebody or uh, those of you that have been married long enough, um, you don't have to really be married that long, but I'll tell you, when, when you're married long enough and you start thinking your partner's thoughts like before they say it or you say what they say, and it's weird. But what happens is the, the longer you know someone and the better that you know someone, the more you pick up their traits. Well, Christianity isn't radically different from that. The better you know God and the more you know God and the longer you know God, the more of his traits that you begin to pick up. And the Bible says here, the one who loves has been born of God and knows God. Knowing God is linked to, to loving others. It says anyone who does not love, that's does not love as a consistent practice anyone who does not love does not know god because god is love in this the love of god was made manifest among us that god sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him so how was love shown god sent the son in this is love not that we have loved god but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin jesus christ was the satisfaction for our sins when jesus hung on the cross he took the punishment that we were due propitiation means that that he satisfied the right rightful just wrath of god for our sins beloved if god so loved us we also ought to love one another and then later on of course, in Scripture, it says we love because he first loved us. God's love is transformational. If you haven't known God's love, if you haven't known God's love and grace and mercy and all of those things, it's impossible for you then to really love others as you ought to love. Now, 
So what do we say in all this? I think we go back to John 13. Let me read it so I don't misquote it at all. John 13. Quite a task he gives us here. John 13. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. Why is it a new commandment? Because there's a new standard. There's a new quality of love you're to have for one another. That new standard is Christ. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. We're to love one another as Christ has loved us. That is an unmerited, sacrificial, concrete act to benefit and bless another. It says you also are to love one another. It says by this, all people will know that you're my disciples. In other words, the world is given the right to make a judgment as to whether or not you're a Christian based on that. It says, by this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another, as Paul put it in Colossians. If we love one another, if we do that, we'll be bound together in this perfect harmony. As the scripture indicates, that perfect harmony expresses itself in a unity to the world that testifies to the truth of the gospel. There's always things bigger at stake than just you having a good relationship with somebody. There's cosmic things at stake, namely the salvation of multitudes. Amen? Amen. All right, we'll pray. And if you're here and you need help, loving, everybody's hands raised, I want to pray. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we do all need help. Lord, to love as we ought to love. Um, I, at least, and I think some here, feel the weight of this commandment, Lord, because there are a lot of things at stake. It's not only me getting along, so to speak, with my brother, but there's actually souls at stake. And um, so, Lord, I pray that you help us. I pray that you, you would help us to put to death the things that need to put to be put to death in our lives. I pray that you would help us to clothe our, help us to clothe ourselves with the things that we need to clothe ourselves with, with kindness, with compassion, Lord, with forgiveness, God, that we would bear with one another and we would love one another in Christ-like ways. And Lord, people would look at that and they would make the judgment. People outside the church would make the judgment. These, these people must know Jesus, because what else could account for that? And Lord, the world might even look at it in a broader sense and say, boy, there's a, there's a, there's a certain unity in the church. They don't, they don't get it perfectly, but, but there's a unity. There's older people with younger people. There's people of different races and people of different ethnicities and all kinds of different people, that, rich people and poor people and all kinds of things. And they have a, a unity that's really unexplainable this message about God sending Jesus to redeem the world and make the world whole, it must be true. So, Lord, there's always this, this witness that's at stake. I pray, God, that you would help us and we would be a church that would be known by our observable love for one another. Amen. 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 Amen.